Welcome to everybody uh, that is here today, whether you're here with us live, watching uh, from home, or you're watching the recording. My name is Monica Rivera. I'm the team leader for Keller Williams Southeast Los Angeles here in Downey, California. Uh, and I am super excited uh, to talk about this topic and to have my colleague here, George Mesa of Pacific Coast Title. I'm going to know uh, best title officer that I've ever worked with. I worked with him personally on uh, a lot of my deals when I was still active and still works with a lot of my clients now, but I have seen him go above and beyond, uh, not just in terms of, you know, how he services and comes from contribution with the clients, but really the amount of education that he brings to the agents. Um, and that's part of why I'm really excited to have you training today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, to share a little bit about what we're going to be talking about today. So obviously the market that we've uh, been in has been a little bit different than, you know, what we've seen in traditional shifts if you've been through shifts beforehand, right? We know that markets go up, markets go down. That's the way of the world. That's economics. That's just the way that it works. Um, and what we're seeing right now is a little bit how do I put it? We're in an unprecedented time. We were hit with the pandemic. The pandemic had uh, different economic effects on, you know, just what's going on, um, which also meant that we saw a lot of mortgage forbearances. Now I'm going to note, this is not the first time that we've seen mortgage forbearances in the real estate market. This has happened before. The difference is right now we're seeing uh, something coming out of uh, a health crisis or this pandemic. That meant that there was a dip in the economy. There was people that lost their jobs. There was a lot of different movement that happened. And he will put their property into something called a forbearance agreement. Now, a forbearance agreement means we are not necessarily paying our mortgage right now. There's a lot of different um, elements around that. There's a lot of different agreements that are out there, depending on the financial institution. They're designed to generally last about a year. They will go as much as 18 months. Um, but it is a temporary band-aid solution, right? What we're seeing now is that we have a foreclosure moratorium that was lifted, right? A foreclosure moratorium that was completely, it expired, it's gone. And we're going to see the effects of what happens next. Now I'm going to know, we are going to talk about a lot of statistics. You're going to hear us talk about a lot of numbers. The one thing I do want to put into perspective for us as we look at what's happening in the market. We get a lot of people that are like, hey, is this going to be like 2007, 2008? Are we going to see a ton of foreclosures? Are we going to see short sales? What does this look like? And we're going to talk about all of that. But when I put it in perspective, I do say this. What we know is that following 2007, 2008, we saw about 10 million properties that went into some type of foreclosure process here in the United States. As of uh, a week ago, there are about 1.6 million properties that are in an active mortgage forbearance right now, right? 10 million, 1.6. And there's gonna be modifications. There's gonna be a lot of different movement that happens. And some of those are gonna be listed. And some of those are gonna be opportunities for you to go out and talk to clients because we know that lead generation is just an opportunity to find people to help. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today. So a lot of stuff. Um, what I do ask, if you are watching from home, uh, please, please, please make sure to use the chat box. We will have a moment where we talk about uh, Q&A. If, uh, if you have a question here in the room, write it down. We will open it up or raise your hand so that we can see you. For those of you that are on Zoom, we will be monitoring it. Um, please, please, please either put it in the chat or raise your hand on Zoom so that we don't have the audio kind of interrupt the conversation here and we will bring you off of Zoom or uh, use the chat box to answer those questions as well. Fair? All right, let's get rolling. Uh, which slide do you want to first? The first capture presentation. Beautiful. All right, can I get a thumbs up, those of you at home, that you can see the slides? Beautiful, thank you. Oh, all right, you guys can see it too. Great. Awesome, Amigo. Can we move these? Okay. Everybody okay with that? Yes. yes. Awesome. And my box, <laughs> 
All right, guys. So when it was Monday, right? I think Monday. Yeah, Monday. I, I turned seven years old. I'm an old guy. I'm very, very old. And for me to get excited, it takes time. I'm so excited about this upcoming market. This market that is approaching and approaching fast mm -hmm. is going to be great. I was sick with COVID. I was even thinking, uh, maybe it's time for me to retire. I'm tired. And then I don't even feel tired. I feel excited. Every morning when I wake up, I want to go and check numbers. I want to check hey, what's going on in this market. I'm very excited. So I hope you guys are excited. I hope you guys understand that there's going to be a lot of opportunities for you guys to pick up listings. This upcoming market is what I call the perfect trifecta. Disclaimer, I have an accent. So if you don't understand what I'm saying, stop me and say, what? The perfect trifecta. Anybody knows what's a perfect trifecta? For a realtor, for a title red, and for a lender. Low rates, buyers, and inventory. What's the problem we have right now? There's no inventory, right? Mm -hmm. You have a, it was crazy, right? That line of 30 people to go to an open house. That was <laughs> crazy. I mean, insane. P. Milton closed a transaction that was like a 200,000 above listing price. I'm like, what? Insane. It's gone. A lot of your buyers, they don't want to go through that. They're waiting, right? So they're going to buy, but they're waiting. Promise, we don't have inventory, but we still have low rates. And you can go to Down Exterminator. Luis Mendoza can tell us about the rates. They're going to be low for a few more months, right, Luis? Just say, go like this, if, I, if you agree <laughs> with me. Low rates. Now, October 1st, the moratorium is over. A lot of inventory start to hit the, our industry. What's going to happen? Number one. It's gonna be perfect for you. That's what I call the perfect trifecta, but also prices are gonna start dropping more and more and more. The more you wait, the more the prices are gonna drop. We agree on that? Yes. That's 101 economics, right? More inventory, more price are gonna, yeah. the price are gonna yes. drop. Okay, next slide, please. Supply and demand. <laughs> Supply and demand, you're right. Unemployment, I did a training. I'm not gonna say the office. I was just telling Monica, I got so upset. Because the realtor, there was a smart guy in that room tell me, oh, that's all. That thing doesn't work. I, I feel like saying you don't. But I did We're say, recording. We're recording. I didn't say, <laughs> that's why I didn't say the office. I showed that from the beginning of the year because that was a problem that we have. Because there was no jobs. People couldn't pay. Yeah, unemployment is much better now. But at the beginning of the year, last year, it was pretty bad. It was pretty high. Check the numbers. Super high. So that's why you see that they, from the beginning of the year, because that was a problem. Why these homeowners, they couldn't pay. Right? Next, please. This is a very, very interesting uh, thing. A lot of jobs are not coming back. We need to understand that. A lot of jobs are gone. You guys remember doing Zoom meetings four years ago? You? I don't. No. When they told me about Zoom, I'm thinking that's like a dance that I need to dance or what's Zoom? Yeah. I, I, nobody knew about Zoom, just you. Well, nobody really knew about Zoom. It's right. well, Skype, it was the thing. But I mean, who was doing meetings? Just big, huge corporations via Skype because you're in, uh, you you were in Barcelona and you were here in LA, <laughs> so you have to do Skype. But normal people like you and me, we're not doing Zoom meetings. I mean, we did Skype one time uh, just for fun and that's it. Conducting business, no. So a lot of jobs are gonna disappear thanks to all these technology, all these things that we encounter. Guess what? Title companies, half of our customer service is working from home. We, I was just in a meeting. We're gonna keep these guys home. That's it, you can work from home. We're gonna follow what Hyundai, the car company is doing. 80% of the workforce is gonna work from home. So you know what's going to happen with a huge building on the 405 freeway? It's for sale. So they don't need that huge building. They're, we're starting to realize, hey, we can save money. We don't need all this space. If you can work from home, we're going to give an allowance. Honda is doing that. We're doing that for, to pay for your internet, this and that. We're going to give you a laptop. 
So a lot of jobs are gonna disappear. That lady cleaning that building, she's not gonna have a job. Security guy over there, he's not gonna have a job. Those are what we call minorities, right? Cleaning lady, waitress, they're not gonna have, a lot of these jobs are gonna disappear. And remember what I just said, cleaning lady, right? You know the lady who cleans KW, there's two ladies, they both own the house. Cleaning lady owning a house. That's not being weird in California. We see that all the time. A guy, a mechanic, my father-in-law worked on a factory all his life. He bought three units. He went to the smallest one, ran the other two, and he, that's the way he did it. Now it's paying full. So it's not hard to see minorities owning properties in California. All right? So a lot of jobs are not coming back. Next. One, one of the things that I want to note here, because I think this is important, um, Gary Keller talked a lot about this. If you guys remember at the last time of the union and um, Mega Camp, for those that were able to watch the video, uh, when we were talking about what was going to happen with the recovery of the economy after the pandemic, he talked about a K-shaped recovery. Some of you guys may have remembered that. When we talk about a K-shaped recovery, we've had a tale of two markets over the last year. Right, exactly what we're talking about. We're seeing a market that took off. We had low interest rates, a ton of buyers, all of a sudden individuals that, I'll give you an example, I had a cousin that lived in San Diego, moved to Chino. Because guess what? She never has to go into the office again. Right? I had a client that moved from Compton out to Paris because all of a sudden he said, guess what? I can work remote forever. Right? But they still had job security in those particular environments. Right now, that's what we talk about K-shaped recovery. That's the part of the K that's going up. That's all of a sudden the people that have the opportunity because in their industries, they have that sense of job security. And then we have the other side of the market where we see people that are losing their jobs, not having the opportunity to gain that back. We have the individuals that are in these mortgage forbearances that are leading us into um, what we're gonna be talking about a lot of with this foreclosure. So it's just important to understand, it can feel like the market is very hot if you're on this side, and it can feel like everything's falling apart if you're on the other side. So it's important for us to understand that so we see what's going on um, at a, a um, bird's eye view. And by the way, Monica can send you this uh, presentation if you want it, so you can read the whole thing, because we're not going to be reading the whole thing. Mm -hmm. This is a, a crazy um, statistic. It's crazy. When I read this, I was like, I, I got excited again. Homeownership by race and ethnicity. Okay? California, we have the number one, two, and three counties on the nation, on the entire nation. Minorities, cleaning lady owning a house, mechanic guy owning a house, factory guy owning a house. The number one, two, and three. And guess what? Those are the ones that have been the most affected. Even if you have a job back, you're behind now a year and a half, a year on your payments. And unfortunately, these people, they don't have a line of credit. They don't have a lot of savings. It's not like the, what's the name of that restaurant, the guy that you won't pay a thousand dollars to put salt in your steak and everybody is posting <laughs> that, like that guy's like a little retarded that you're going there, but hey, that's a different topic. Yeah, that guy closed his doors for three months. He was struggling, but at the end, it was a big checking account, a big saving account. He reopened with no problems and he's still doing the little stuff with no problem. The lady cleaning the, the office at Hyundai, she lost her job. She couldn't pay. She got a job back. But again, she's so behind now that it's going to be hard for her to go back. So you guys need to understand that, that we're so lucky. And again, it's not, it's kind of crazy to say lucky, right? Well, you guys are in the real estate business. You guys are lucky to be in LA County, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties that they're so close because there's going to be a lot of opportunities. Next. I think we already talked about this. And if somebody says, yes, they're going to be short sales, I'm going to go and I'm going to go like this. There's no short sales, guys. Stop talking about short sales. There's too much equity on this industry. Too much. It was crazy. Just to give you an example, last year, 2020, I took a plane to Spain on March 1st telling my wife, you're crazy. This is nothing. This is just a flu. My partner, who's over there, was telling me, you, are you going to go to Spain? You're crazy. My granddaughter. Don't go, don't go. I'm like, that's nothing, right? We took a plane. We were going to be there for four weeks. After two weeks, I was saying, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You were right. You were right. 
coming back to LA, I was thinking, man, who we're gonna have to cut on the company? How we're gonna restructure the whole thing? I was thinking the worst. Nobody was expecting this market to go up like crazy on equity and all this. It was insane. Well, guess what? It happened. It was, it was one of the best years for Tata companies ever. I think it was best year ever, right, Anthony? Ever in the Tata industry. And let me show you the next slide. There's $6.5 trillion on equity just on 2020. It's a lot of money, a lot of money. That's why there's not going to be short sales. We have all this equity. So yeah, it's going to start going down, right? But to this, to go like this, upside down, maybe 2025, 26, I don't think it will happen. But if you want to talk about short sales, talk to me in a couple more years. Not right now. There's no short sales, period. And that's a very unique market. 2006, 7, 8, 9, 10, all that. It was all short sales, right? I mean, it was short sales up and down. You don't even ask. You already know if you're in sh it's going to be a short sell. I think every single deal that we closed those years that were short sales, it was rare to see an equity sell. I was like, hey, you, you have money? You're selling? Wow. Maybe you're selling because you want to buy all these sh short sales. <laughs> yeah, you guys said, oh, I have a lot of equity in my house. Let me sell and buy two, three properties because it was insane how much they dropped. But again, we have so much equity that no short sales. Next. At least 70% of homeowners, they have at least 20% of equity. 70%, at least 20% equity. So what's the difference, sir? What's your name? Carlos. Carlos, what's the difference between real estate and Wall Street? They move money, right? It's all about money. This is Wall Street. Today you have a stock that is worth $100. And on Monday, this stock can go like this, to $1. That can happen, that will happen my back real estate will never go like this never ever detroit was one of the worst on the short sale on the 2007 8 it didn't went like this it goes like this 500 550 570 whatever little by little doesn't go like that okay understand that sorry again carlos yeah understand that carlos wall street can drop like this wall street will, i mean uh, real estate will never drop like this next Carlos, I'm gonna pick on you. How late you need to win your payment for the for, for the lender to start the pre-foreclosure payment? I mean process, sorry, to start the pre-foreclosure process in California being a non-judicial state. What do you think? Three months. Three months. And by the way, guys, there's not a bad answer. And I'm gonna explain why there's not a bad answer. Because you are wrong, but you're right. It's not three months, it's a month and one day. But Lenders were always giving you at least three months. Always. I don't ever recall seeing a lender after a month and one day start the process. When I was single and I was paying for my mortgage, I was always late. Never remember that. But, and that was the old time that you do a check and you mail the check. And I used to get, oh my God, the check and I need to do it. So they don't do it after a month and one day. That's what you're right. It's usually three months. So three months you're late and they can start the process of pre foreclosure. All right, next, please. Next, I'm, the gonna answer. Get, I'm sure there's some people in here that it's, what, what's the checkbook again? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm going to stop. I went, to, I went to the market across the street yesterday, and this lady's paying with, with her watch. I'm like, can you do that? I was amazed. I'm like, show me how. So, well, you need an iPhone, whatever watch. I'm like, oh, I don't have one of those. I'm thinking I'm getting one of those so I can just go like this. Crazy. <laughs> Yes, I used to use checkbooks, okay? <laughs> so yeah, a month and one day you're late on your payments. Next, please. Judicial versus non-judicial. California, it's a non-judicial state most of the time. Once in a blue moon, you're gonna get into the judicial. What's the difference between judicial and non-judicial? And you can sit with Luis and Downey Capital, the lenders, our preferred lenders, great lenders, by the way. You're wasting your time if you're going somewhere else. They can tell you, they can show you when you're signing your loan docs towards the end, when you're all tired and says initial, 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 and your plan is going like this. Well, it's called the rate rider. And the rate rider is going to tell you, you're giving me the okay to start the process of pre foreclosure if you're late a month on Monday. Live, you're signing the okay for the lender to start the process. That's a non judicial state. Judicial state, the lender needs to go to court and say, Mr. Judge, 
Carlos is not paying his mortgage. Can I start the process? The judge is going to analyze it. Yeah, you can start the process. More and more states, they want to change it to a non judicial state. Why? Show me the next slide, please. Because there's places like New York, New Jersey, and Florida that takes up to three years to foreclose on a house. Crazy, right? And guess what? Those states, minority, usually they don't own, they rent. It takes three years to foreclose on a property. Crazy. California, they can start the process after a month. So that's the difference between judicial, non judicial. You guys remember Michael Jackson's uh, ranch, Never Neverland? That was a judicial. That's why it took so long. So mainly you're going to see that on commercial properties. That's your map, and you see California is both judicial and non judicial. It's just, there's not a lot of, uh, don't even worry about this. It's just for you to understand judicial versus non judicial. Next. California pre foreclosure timeline. And this is called pre foreclosure. We use the term eight and a half foreclosures. Foreclosure when they foreclose on the property. In reality, it's called pre foreclosures. Before they foreclose, pre foreclosures are NLDs and trustee sales. So, Carlos, you're late three months on your payment, more or less. You don't do nothing, the lender is going to start the process that is called notice of default, three months. You sit on that for three months, you don't do nothing. You, you're going to go to the second stage, the last stage also, that is called notice of trustee sale. What's the difference between an NOD and a trustee sale? NOD, you have three months. On a trustee sale, you have 21 days, and there's a place, a minimum bid, and a time where your house is going to be optioned. Any questions about those process? NOD, trustee sale? If you were doing real estate on the 80s, you're going to remember trustee sales were 25 days. They change it on the 2000s beginning to 21 days. So that's the only difference. Time and a place, a minimum bid, and a time of where your house is going to be auctioned. Sounds pretty appealing to go to the auction. I know Carlitos is thinking, hey, I want to go to the auctions. I want to buy houses in the auctions. Carlos, what's your name? You too. Chris, Chris you're excited, right? You say, I'm going to take my investors. Name? Diego. JR, you guys three are gonna, yes, let's put our money together. Let's go to the auction. Be careful. It's tricky to go to the auctions. It's for big boys. Not that you guys are not big boys, but you need to understand the process. And when I say big boys, you don't go and say, hey, I'm qualified for 500,000 and my five was eight, 10. They don't care, it's cash. You can have the worst five on planet Earth. You have cash, you're in. So you're planning to go to the auction, be careful. We're gonna talk about that in a few more seconds. So four things can happen at the auction, can get postponed. You see the first one with a little arrow going back to the auction, postpone to a future date. The lender, the, the trustee is gonna analyze everything and say, yeah, you have a great offer. Let me postpone this and your next sell date is gonna be October 20th. Postpone to a future date. Second, can be sold to bank. Crazy, right? I am the lender, I am the lien holder, it's my loan and I need to buy it. That doesn't make no sense. Why do we need to buy my own loan? Any, idea, any ideas why? There's enough equity. No, that's not the reason. There's one thing that you're not gonna escape, taxes, taxes. There is, there is one universal law and it is the banks and the IRS always win. The second universal law is the banks and the IRS never lose. Somebody needs to pay taxes on that trustee sale. So in order for me to pay taxes, it needs to be a sale. So minimum bid plus $1 goes back to the bank. That's how much the bank is paying for that. Minimum bid is whatever the amount that the lender puts plus $1. So that's why it goes back to the bank as an REO now, bank loan, but somebody needs to pay taxes. Somebody pays taxes on these trustee sales. There's nothing you can do to avoid paying taxes. 13, sold to a third. Three kids are gonna go as investors, high five. We got this beautiful house for 500,000. Yes, it's our new investment. Or can get canceled for no reason. Maybe there's a file of BK. There's so many tricks now to stop trustee sales that if you need help, just Walk into my office and I can tell you how can stop the trustee sale legally without doing anything illegal. Those are four things that happen at the trustee sale, nothing else. Any questions about trustee sales? Again, be careful about going to the trustee sales. I'm gonna talk about that in a second, next. 
Okay, just you can skip that one. It's just uh, information about numbers of default trustee sell timelines and write up redemptions. Just read that. Long to value. That's key for you guys to understand. Too bad that Luis and Downey Capital are not here, so they can tell us more about long to value. We don't want lenders here to explain <laughs> long to value. You're going to get all confused. Pretty simple. Long to value is like losing weight. If you lose weight, you look good, right? If you get fat like me, you don't look good. Losing weight. Just think of losing weight. It's very simple. Break even point, 100% you're at zero. That's your break even point. If it goes up, that's why it's on red, you're gaining weight. If it goes down, green, money is good. Think like that. The reason I'm telling you this is because, and that's a formula that lenders can use to determine that. But Javier Munoz from Down Exterminators can send this farming to you with a loan to value. So right away you can see, okay, there's a lot of money in this house. 20% loan to value, man, there's a lot of cash and uh, equity in the house. Let me go and help this guy. If you see 110% loan to value, but it's upside down, that's a short sale. So right away getting that farming, you can tell right away before this type of farming, you needed to call the bank, ask the bank for payoffs and this and that, and you do the math. Okay, yeah, it's upside down. Now, just opening that farming, you can tell right away if that's gonna be standard sell, then 99.9 .9 is gonna be, but you're gonna be able to see that there's a lot of equity or not that much equity, right? So let's do a quick exercise. You have two houses in the same street, PCT Avenue, here in the city of Downey. House to the left, there's an NOD on trusty cell file. House to the right, same thing, an NOD and a trusty cell file. The one on the left, there's $200,000 on equity. The LTV is 50%. The one on the right, they're upside down, 50, minus 50,000. 50, so the one on the right, it's a short sell. The one on the left, it's a standard sell. Who needs to sell faster, Carlos? The one on the right. The one on the right, low LTV. Again, your name? Chris. Chris. Who needs to sell faster? The one on the right. The one on the right. 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 You guys are wrong. The left. The left. Why? That's a key to understand because it's easy to say yes, left, or right. And this is what you guys need to master today. This is going to be the key for you guys to go out and get these listings. Master this. Next, please. The one on the left needs to sell faster because there's equity. There's too much money in the house. Can they lose that equity? If they foreclose on the house. Can they learn say, oh, thank you so much. Now I have my loan and 200,000 more. No, it's against the law. California is a non-judicial state. The lender cannot keep that equity, but also non-judicial, you can use up to 20% of the equity to pay for trustee sales fees, court fees, lawyers, this and that. Who's a trustee? Trustee is a lawyer. They make around 350 to 450 dollars an hour. Three months being late, three months of uh, NOD, 21 days of trustee sale. You don't think they're gonna use 20 percent? You're crazy. They're gonna use up to the last penny. That 20 percent that they can take from that 200 thousand, they're gonna use it. So Carlos, I'm pretty bad with math. 20 percent of 200 thousand is 40 thousand. Smart kid. $40,000 you're losing if they foreclose on the house. It's a lot of money, right? Keep this in mind. $40,000 you are going to lose on that house. So now we have $160,000 left, right? Well, guess what? I don't have a job. I need that money fast. Where can I get my money, Carlos? Carlos, I have real bad news for you. You need to put a claim into that money. That money will not be sent. It's going to be sent to a trust account by law in California being a non-judicial state. It goes to a trust account and sits in that trust account for 10 years until you put a claim. And putting a claim, Carlos, is not easy. It's not easy. Usually you need to hire somebody to do that for you. By law, they can charge another 10% of this 160. So now that's another 16,000. So you do the math, 56,000 will go to the trustee cell and you put in the claim, 56,000. Sir, Carlos, it's cheaper to sell your house with me as your realtor, because I'm only gonna charge you 6% than you losing 56,000. Do you agree? Yeah. So you're gonna sell your house with me? I'm gonna know, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say right now, um, 
I am off screen. Uh, I'm going to say this right now because I think that this is extremely important for us to understand, right? When we look at what happened in the previous market, the majority of homes were short sale. They were underwater, right? Which means, guess what? A lot of people were trying to give their deeds back. They were trying to do a lot of different things because they didn't have equity. We have had some of the biggest, like the past years, we've seen major appreciation in the real estate market. Prices have gone up. And yet there are people that are in a tough situation right now and they need to sell, right? But here's the thing. We as realtors, we see what's going on in the market. We're watching the market. We see it. We understand it a little bit more. Clients don't. Consumers don't, right? The homeowners don't. They think I can give my deed back or, hey, I have this free money and I'm just going to write it out because that's what I saw happen before. They don't understand this. If there's one thing that you are utilizing to talk to clients about why it's gonna be better for them to sell now, because here's the thing, I'll be honest with you guys, when we start looking at notice of default, we start talking about people that are behind on their mortgage. I don't know about you guys, but when somebody's in a tough financial situation, they're emotional about it. There's a lot of feelings around that. There's a lot of frustration. Right. And there's two things that we know it's logic makes people think emotion can be very overwhelming. And while it makes people act, negative emotion can also make people wait. Right. Our job as the fiduciary for a client is to educate them on what they're at risk of losing in the process. This is. It's, it's simple, right? But it's not necessarily good. We have, our job is to make this extremely easy for the client to understand. This is what we're talking about in a listing presentation. It's not just, here's what I'm going to do to market your property. It's, hey, let's really talk about what you're at risk of losing. This is worst case scenario. Here's best case scenario. What would you like to do? Can you show the next, uh, the one that you, not this one, the other one that I sent you? The market? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So this is one of the biggest problems that you're going to encounter. Homeowners are not paying the mortgage right now because they don't have a job. They can't pay. They, they're so behind. So they think that they're living in the house for free. Right. I'm living in the house for free, right? Okay. Yeah, that, that's I know. I just haven't, oh, I haven't shared it. it. Oh, okay. share? So they think they're living in the house for free. Guess what, guys? This is coming from car. This next slide is coming from car. It's not me. You see a decline. You start to see the decline. Yeah. This is in California. Here. This is last last month. You're gonna see the decline. So the more you wait, Coronado, the more you equity you're gonna lose. Yeah. So if you sell now, you get five hundred thousand. If you wait maybe six months, a year, then you're gonna go for fifty. So you lost fifty thousand. That's the way you're paying for your mortgage through your equity. So you start losing equity. So don't think you're living for free. You guys need to understand that because that has to be part of your presentation when you talk yeah. to these homeowners. You're losing money by not doing anything because now. It's not going like this anymore. If it was going like this, yeah, just sit and wait. Sit and wait. But um, I can tell you right now, Tony, he, he was on the stock market last year, right? Or two years ago. And he was so upset because he was selling. He, was, he bought this stock and he was waiting, waiting to sell it. And he just hoping that he was going to go over and then broke, collapsed and he lost. So I think the beautiful thing about real estate is not going to collapse like this. Well, now we're seeing, we're seeing now the decline. This is the perfect time to sell. If you wait, this is a little clock that they're going to foreclose on your house. And guys, there's not a law in California saying you need to give me an extension just because I have a lot of equity in my house. <laughs> the banks, sorry, Luis, if you think banks are, or lenders are Mother Teresa's, you're wrong. They're here to lend. If they can push you to sell your house, and then create a new loan, then we'll do it. There's too much equity on those houses. We were just talking about last year, the boom, it was mainly on refinances. It was not on resales, mainly refinances. Guess what happened with your refinances, with your taxes? Stay the same. So California is losing millions of dollars with this moratorium. So they're very eager to start this process. For the lender to start the process of pre-foreclosure because there's going to be a lot of taxes, supplemental taxes, 
pay. So you're talking about millions and millions of dollars. Yeah. So again, yeah, they all want to look good. They all want to help this and that. The reality, they want you to sell your house so we can create more taxes and more supplementals and more inventory and that wheel is going to start moving. Real estate is the second biggest industry in this country. They want you to sell your house. Lenders, they don't want to give you a loan. Right, Marta, 2.3% for five years. I mean, for 30 years. No, they want you to change or refinance or sell every five years. That's the goal they have every five years to start moving that. All right, next, we can go back to the other one. Any questions? Carlos, you're too quiet. Scared? <laughs> I'm too loud. Yes, sir. I couldn't see very clearly. Uh, what was the, uh, the, the drop in, in the sales in August? Uh, uh, you're talking about, you're, are you talking about in pricing? The, what you just showed on the slide. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let me. Now, what's the, what's the 414 860. That's going and, from Garth. And I'm going to know, we talk about this. If, if you're on the Monday uh, sessions that I do, um, I'm going over this for on a week by week basis for Los Angeles, Orange, San Bernardino, and Riverside County. We've been talking about this decline in active price for, uh, the I would say, at least the last three weeks. Right, at least consistently. Now, obviously, uh, when we're looking at data like this, we're looking at all of California and this data from CAR. What we're looking at is what, what I would consider a micro market, but this is also going to fluctuate city by city, right? We see the biggest declines right now happening in condos um, or condos sitting a lot longer, and anything that's going to require a jumbo loan, we tend to see the biggest declines first before it starts hitting the SFR market. It's important that we talk about this regularly because what you're seeing out on the field is going to be based on what clients you're serving. You're not necessarily always seeing the market as a whole, right? So if you're focused on specific micro markets and that particular market is seeing an increase or you're still in a competitive multiple offer scenario and prices are still selling over ask, right? That's important, but there's also, um, we have to understand what's happening on the big picture because what we start seeing is what's happening on the big picture is then going to start impacting appraisals. There's a lot of moving parts with this, right? So what we're seeing and what we feel in the moment is not always going to be a, a crystal clear picture of what's coming. What we're looking at and a lot of what we're talking about and what we do on Mondays um, is specifically to have an understanding of what is happening as it's happening week over week. What are the trends uh, showing us? And that's what CAR is looking at. That's a, that's a great training. I would love to be invited to that you training. You can always come on. <laughs> uh, are, we, are you guys seeing the right slides? Yes. If they foreclose, there, this, there are consequences. Thumbs up. Grace, right. can you see the screen? I think so. Wow. He's that's frozen. Awesome. He froze. <laughs> All right, guys. So this is the consequences if they foreclose on your property. Lender can use up to 20% of your equity. We talk about that, right? You need to put a claim to get your money back. And I forgot to put, they can charge up to 10% of your, whatever money you have on that trust account. Your credit will be get damaged around 250 points. Uh, uh, time to, uh, that's gonna say your credit, seven to 10 years is like a BK, pretty much. Qualify for a new mortgage, five to seven years. I think FHA, Marta is, uh, I think it's only three years for FHA. But again, you're gonna lose a lot of money if you wait. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? If you're planning to go to the auction, be careful. You need to check your index. What's the index? Who's pushing the foreclosure? I was just telling Monica, a friend that we have, when I'm by Monica knows this guy, when I bought this property in Long Beach, I think it was 2008 or nine, I don't remember exactly the date. He paid $80,000 for a condo in front of the ocean in Long Beach. Great deal, right? He bought that at the auction. The problem is he bought a second. That was a first for a million one. <laughs> so he is responsible for that. You're responsible for the first loan. So he bought a second thinking that he scored big time. At the end, we analyze everything and we give him the bad news. And he goes, well, what can I do? I said, you can sure sell your new house, <laughs> your new condo. That was funny. He, money, and Monica knows that guy and I, it was bad, but you need to understand that you're buying the, uh, whatever you're buying, the first is solid. 
You're not going to lose that. It, it was a very expensive lesson that I hope you all learned from so you don't go through it. <laughs> Hero programs, and I miss, I, I forgot to put PACE, Hero and PACE programs. Whoever created a Hero program is my hero. Very smart guy. They're crooks, but very smart guy. You know what they put those Hero programs on the PACE? On the taxes. So guess what? If they foreclose, somebody needs to pay taxes, right? So that $40,000 rule for windows or solar panels, I don't care, I'm gonna get paid. They don't care if they foreclose. The second a choice they can lose. Here on pace, they stay solid. So that's why I said, we're creating this hero program. My hero, smart guy, whoever approved <laughs> it, it's a crook. Mechanic links, I stay with the property too. Cannot call your title rep say, what can I do? Nothing, you need to pay. You cannot disappear the mechanic links. Don't trust me on the next one, Senate Bill 1079. Remember, put that on your little notes, 1079, Google it later, because what I'm gonna tell you is gonna sound crazy. So now, you two go and buy this property for half a million dollars. You all excited, right? Our first investment, high five, we're gonna sell it for 750. Well, a nonprofit or the tenant of the house, they have three days to file a notice of, uh, of intent, notice of intent to buy that property. If they file that, your half a million dollars, guys, goes to a trust account for 45 days. It's going to stay there until the nonprofit or the tenant, they complete the sale. And guess what? They can apply for a loan. They can do, they can get their money, cash, whatever. I'm not too afraid of the tenant, but I'm afraid of nonprofits. They have money and they're waiting. There's a, there's a nonprofit in LA called Na Neighborhood Stabilization. Na neighborhood Housing. No, that's not NACA, that's some, yeah. something else. We have a friend who runs that. And believe me, he's always come and say, any, any, any investment properties, we buy cash. They even wanna pay extra because it's a nonprofit, they need to move that money. Mm -hmm. So be careful if you're planning to go with your investors, make sure that you do your homework on 1079. Right now, nobody's talking about that because to file, in LA County, that type of notice will take more than three days because LA County is closed. So it's not a big deal and there's no trusty cell. So nobody's paying attention to that one. But as soon as we go back to normal county opens, be careful, you can get popped. You need to understand the foreclosure on the IRS 120 days to redemption period. Pretty much, you buy in a foreclosure, you need to wait 120 days to sell it. You cannot sell it. We have a transaction with somebody, oh, Tony, can you call Suhela? She called me. <laughs> with Suhaila Sabir, and she was all upset with title. Why title? You guys stopped in my transaction. Not us. It's the law. That's a couple of years ago. I'm glad I remember. She called me to me. Okay, <laughs> next, please. Okay, farming and marketing is provided by Javier Munoz from Down Exter Exterminators. He was supposed to be here, but I think he got caught up on an inspection. For title companies, it's illegal to help you with marketing and farming. It's against the law, and I'm not going to break the law. But Javier, you guys are lucky to be here to use Javier. <laughs> he can help you with all these farming and all this marketing. Can you show the next one? This is the type of the farming that he can say you notice the delinquency, late, no NLD, no trust yourself, people late on their payment. That's gold, that's beautiful. Next. Is it, I'm gonna know this information right here, this is huge, right? This is huge. And this or, is, or you can go wait at the courthouses that are close to try to get the data. <laughs> thanks to Monica and Keller Williams with uh, Javier Munoz. Don't even try to call Javier Munoz. Say, I work somewhere else. Can you help me? Because he's going to say no. <laughs> Notice of default, the first stage, three months we have, okay. right? Pretty simple to read it. Very good information. Next one is Notice of Trustee Cell, the last stage. Okay, do you see on red, it's kind of hard to see on what's it, there's an arrow going like this, a little one, that's the LTV. He changed that to 154% just to prove that or to show you where's the LTV. The house was 54% LTV. There was over $800,000 on equity on the house and he was gonna go to the trustee cell. Crazy, 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 crazy. Now, can you go back to the first farming, notice the delinquency? Okay, can you zoom on the name? Who says trust or yeah. owner's contact information? Can you guys see the name of this guy is um, uh, okay. ah, I mean, I mean uh, Akbasan or something like that. You see private number, then you see the phone number. Yes. 
This is notice of delinquency. Can you call somebody when they're in the do not call list, when they're in notice of delinquency? No. It's against the law. You will get in trouble. The more high end you go, the more that you're going to get popped. You call a lawyer in uh, Beverly Hills and say, hey, who gave you my number? Why you call me? I don't recommend that you call notice of delinquency when they're in the do not call list. Can you go to the next one? And also, can you zoom in? Perfect. So we have, what's the name? Younes Nabilzi, private number, and there's an email. So the email and the number says private. Can you call a private number again? Sorry, I'm a no guy. I don't remember what you guys said. No. no, guess what? Yes, you can call because now it's notice of default, your public record. As soon as you hit NOD, you become a public record. I'm not that old. So you can call, you can email, you can learn, you can do everything because now it's public record. So NOD, yes. Notice of delinquency, no. As soon as they, first, they start the pre foreclosure process, you can call, you can email, you can learn, you can whatever you want to do because it's public record. You go to the courthouse and you pay $5 for it. Each record is $5. You don't need to pay $5. You work at KW, you get these for free every morning. Next. Um, I'm gonna know, I have to give the, the disclaimer uh, because we have a lot of guests that are on the line, both here in office and uh, watching from home. Please, please, please refer to the uh, TCPA policy in your office. And for our agents, you know, that's on our leverage page to have access to that. So I have to give the disclosure, but there you go. Thank you, thank you. So next is the farming. I mean, the, sorry, the marketing that you can get through Downy Exterminators. Well, let me, let me zoom out a little. Options are knocking at the door. Let's, have a, let, let's talk about how you can avoid foreclosure. We're not talking about avoiding short sales. All this marketing that you're going to see that they can do with your picture, your logo, your name and all that. It's all about these problems that we have. Can you go to the next one? We're almost done. Now is the right time to sell. Forbearance is not forgiveness. This is a great flag to talk about. Hey, you're not living for free. You're losing equity now because we pick already. As soon as we pick, now it's all the way down. So that's a good flag for that. Next one could be uh, best options can be tricky. The pandemic has uh, affected all of us. So there's all these fires can be turned into postcards thanks to Javier Munoz from Down Exterminators. Next, are you circumstances causing a need to sell? So there's all kind of flyers that they can help you marketing that they can help you for 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 you guys to go or not uh, start your text campaign, your email campaign. Any of these fires can be turned into a JPEG or social media post. So there's a lot of uh, flyers, a lot of marketing for you guys. Yes, my marketing one, two, three, four. That me. That's where you can see those flyers. Okay. Any questions about the training? We have a couple more things we're going to go through, um, but I want to open it up for questions before we switch gears a little bit. Oh, let me check the chat. Questions here? No, let's see. Are you single? No, I'm there. Uh, <laughs> I see Maribel. Uh, I will, this will, we'll send you the information uh, after for our associates. Um, they, this is going to be something where we have a website that's dedicated to um, our marketing partnership with Javier Munoz as well. So we'll make sure to get that out again. And we'll post it in the hub, uh, Maribel, our, our Facebook group. Questions? Awesome. My friend, okay, help me to thank my friend Jorge because you always bring a lot of information. We're gonna go through a couple more items, but I know how busy you are. And I know you have a couple calls to return that are coming. I see your phone already. <laughs> let, me, let me run. Muchísimas gracias, thank you, amigo. Thank you, gracias. Okay. Thank you guys. Awesome. So we have a couple more things that I wanna go through because I think that it's important for us to understand What's happening in the market is kind of that first piece that we have to know. And then it's how do we use this to actually go have conversations to talk to clients, fair? Yes. For those of you that are here in office, I'm gonna actually uh, ask you, Jovita, if you can hand out these packets. There's gonna be three pieces. Oh, there's three, three pages for each one. And let me actually keep one. I'm gonna keep one. And I'm gonna move that up here um, as well so that you guys can see it on the screen. So I just want to get clarity that we just switch gears to the section that says COVID for uh, COVID for Bearings database. You guys see that? Thumbs up from home. 
I got a, a thumbs up. Beautiful, thank you so much. Okay, so one of the things that I think is really important when we start talking about what's happening in this market, we have an understanding of what's going on. We have an understanding of where we can get that data. We have an understanding of part of how we have this communication. We also have to have an understanding of how do we start talking to these clients and um, a really good understanding of what is it exactly when it comes to the forbearances has happened within the last year. I'm gonna know, I know we're uh, short on time, so I am gonna move quickly with this, with this mind map, as well as the script map uh, and what are the scripts that we have. We're gonna move through it very, very quickly. And then I will um, probably review this a little bit on our Monday training, fair? Yeah. Okay, awesome. So one, when it came to COVID forbearances, and I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna pop in a little bit deeper here. We're gonna start off with what happened if somebody was employed. So there was two scenarios that happened when we started getting into the forbearance uh, market and what was going on. In a lot of cases, the banks literally started calling the homeowners and saying, hey, do you wanna go into a mortgage forbearance? I know this because the banks called my brother and he called me and said, hey, the banks give, my bank is giving me a call, my lender's giving me a call and they're saying, hey, do you wanna go into a forbearance? And I said, don't do it. If you can make the payments, don't do it, right? And we're, we'll talk a little bit about why. And then we had another agent who came to me and said that she called the financial institution of her client, who was an elderly woman while she's on speakerphone, um, who didn't really know what to do and, and how do I move forward with this? And the bank said, oh, great. Would you like us to opt her in? And she said, well, can you send me the agreement? They said, no, 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 we can just opt you in over the phone. That's what happened, right? We saw a lot of that happening is these financial institutions were saying, hey, would you like to go into forbearance? Now, here's the thing. We had two scenarios. There was somebody that was employed and then there was those that lost employment, okay? Um, the first thing that generally happens if somebody goes into a, a or was employed, they had an option to do one of two things. They had an option to potentially do a refinance or to go into forbearance. That's what we're talking about here, cash out refinance reserves, right? Financial counsels on expenses and negotiating with creditors. Here's the thing. If they opted into the forbearance, that refinance is off the table. Because although it doesn't didn't necessarily have an immediate negative impact on their credit score, what we have seen is in pooling credit that it says forbearance. And so the lenders of the banks, right? The banks are looking at this and they're like, oh no, they already have an agreement. We're not gonna create a new agreement, right? So I want you guys to understand what happened. From there, we saw four types of forbearances, four types of forbearances. Um, some of these, the terms still haven't been released. So right now there was, uh, obviously there was the CARES Act. There was a lot of different things that kind of came into play with this four different types of forbearances. And this is if they have a forbearance agreement that stipulates these terms. Some of the financial institutions are still figuring out what this is gonna look like. So deferred payments tacked onto the end of the year loan, at the end of your loan. I have a 30 year loan. Now I'm gonna have additional payments that are tacked onto the end. Okay, what I wanna make clear is this was not like I get to choose what option I want. Right. It was here's four, and we here, this is what we're doing as a financial institution, okay? Um, deferred payments spread out over the period of payments. This is almost like we say, hey, this is your payment. When you start paying, you're gonna pay an increased payment, right? So that we could spread out that debt that you now owe over the course of your loan. Number three, no repayment terms at all. We'll figure it out later. That's scary. I'm just gonna note that right now, right? There's a lot of people that went into forbearances without knowing what the terms of their forbearance was gonna be. Third option, deferred payments due in full at the end of the forbearance. So imagine this, you're a homeowner, you, lose, you are employed and you could have paid, right? But you decide to go into forbearance and you have, all of a sudden you have to pay this mortgage and you're like, you know what? I'm just gonna spend this money and I'm gonna go do this and I'm gonna go do that. And all of a sudden we go by a year later 
and you owe a year of payments. Where are you getting the money from if you didn't save it? What is that going to look like? Oh, and there's interest. All right. So this is what's important for us to understand about this. Now, if you're talking to a client that has already gone into a forbearance, they're employed, there's a couple different options that there are, right? They are going to prepare to repay this forbearance. If they know the terms of their forbearance agreement, great. If not, they're probably going to be looking at a potential modification as that opens up. Here's the thing that we're seeing. There's a couple things that happen with banks. So I'm going to make this clear before we move on to um, how they prepare for repayment. There have absolutely been scenarios, right? And this is this actually, um, I don't know if he's still on the line, but we shared this at a previous training, a personal scenario of somebody that we know who shared that in the last market adjustment, they had a home, they went into a six month forbearance agreement that their bank said, hey, you're going to, um, more than likely, you're going to have these deferred payments. It'll either be tacked on or we'll do a modification at the six months. At the six month, he tried to get in contact with his financial institution to figure out how he was going to do the repayment. They went out, they sold the loan. They sold the loan, right? And so what happened in that particular case is the new financial institution said, oh no, we are not gonna honor the terms of the forbearance agreement that you have for foreclosing on the property. And he had the home, the home was foreclosed on, it sold an auction, he had somebody knocking on his door saying, hey, we own the house now, you gotta go. Okay, so I wanna know, and not only that, we talked about equity, there was equity in the home. That sucks, right? Just through and through, terrible situation to be in. So. It's important that we understand why this is so important because our fiduciary job for our clients, right, is to help them, okay? What I'm gonna talk about when we talk about preparing for repayment and advising our clients if that is an option for them doesn't necessarily mean that we sell a house right now. Right. I'm just gonna be honest with you guys, right? We come from contribution. Sometimes that means we sell a house. Sometimes it means we deepen a relationship and earn ourselves a referral and a lifetime client and future business, okay? So this is not, we're doing everything to force somebody into sell. We wanna, we lay out the options, that's the job, right? We lay out the options and we find the ones that are ready to potentially move forward. Now there's gonna be more that are in this situation that have to potentially move forward because they're in a bad situation and they don't wanna lose this money, right? It's our job to share with them what the options are. So in some cases, if they are employed or potentially regained employment, preparing for repayment, there's a couple of different ways to do that. I highly recommend you advise your clients to also talk to a financial advisor. We are not financial advisors. We are, we are real estate consultants, right? That's the job. Um, with that being said, they use their reserves or their savings, right? They might wipe out their savings if they have them. There was a, a part of the a law that was passed during COVID allowed people to tap into their retirement funds. They might tap into their retirement funds and literally wipe out their lifetime savings, right, of what they had set aside for retirement. Um, so there's a lot of that loss that people have, have incurred of loss of retirement funds. If they were thinking of selling in the next three to five years, this is where the best scenario for them is likely to sell the property, to bank the proceeds, to rent until the market dips or downsize, right? And something smaller if they still have employment so that they do not lose the funds by ending up in a pre-foreclosure process, fair? This is if they're employed. Obviously the side where they're not employed is way, uh, way more complicated. Same thing we talk about, hey, they're unemployed. There are still four different uh, type of forbearance agreements. We have uh, no repayment terms at all, due in full at the end. Uh, we wanna make sure they understand those agreements. Preparing for repayment, personal loan reserves of savings. Now here's what's a little bit different. And you're not gonna be the one to advise your client on filing a bankruptcy, right? But this is the scenario of what potentially happens in this case, um, tapping into retirement funds. Now, this is where we start getting into selling. 
There's two scenarios here. They're selling when they have an equity position, meaning they have equity in the, in the property, right? And they have the opportunity to sell before they hit pre-foreclosure and lose this money that we're talking about on the board, right? There's also no equity. I'm gonna go through no equity very, uh, very quickly here. In terms of having, uh, let me move this to the side so you guys can see this. In terms of having no equity. So this is where we talked about short sale, foreclosure uh, sale, et cetera. I'm gonna note, one of the things that is very clear or is necessary for us to understand, we said it already, there are not very many short sales. Don't get me wrong, we've had some that we've dealt with in this office in the last year. It's been like one or two in the grand scheme of things. There are not a lot of short sales that are out there right now. One thing that is very important though for us to understand is that even when somebody goes into a short sale, that doesn't mean that the rest of the debt is being forgiven, right? A short sale means the bank is saying we would allow you to sell it at a lower cost than what, because the property is worth more based on the worth less on market value based on what is owed on the property. So to use arbitrary numbers, the property is at market value worth 400,000, but you owe the bank 500,000, that is a $100,000 short, right? That you are short. That is what a short sale means. Here's the thing. The bank says, we're gonna allow you to sell it for less, but you still owe fees. And you still owe us that extra 100,000. Did I get a question coming? Oh, I'm gonna drop you on mute real quick. Um, so that, that we're not gonna go into the short sale piece completely. We actually went over this map on, uh, really in depth on a previous training that I'm happy to send out for those that want it, um, where we really dig into this. Foreclosure sale, we went through a lot of this as well. Uh, de what deficiency judgment is, that's gonna be really important for you guys, is that it's that 100K or whatever additional expenses that were not able to be paid off during that, that uh, the basically when you sell the property and there's a deficiency still, is that they can still have a deficiency against their credit. And now all of a sudden that 100K, you still owe it. Or that 30,000 or the fees or whatever it is, it doesn't mean it just goes away. Right, it gets tacked on because the universal law is the banks and the IRS always win. And the banks and the IRS never lose, right? Um, and then when we really start getting into, okay, they have no, no um, whether they have no equity, selling before going into default, bringing cash to the table. We know when they sell, they have the ability to preserve their credit and hopefully buy in the future. In an equity position, again, they have two options for pre, going into pre-foreclosure and being a foreclosure sale or selling before going into default. This is the map. So this is so you guys have clarity around what happens in each scenario. The second sheet that is in front of you is a little bit more of a script around what are the points that you're going to go through as you're working with a particular client that might be in this position, right? If this is somebody in your database, so I'm gonna note this particular script here is very much geared towards your sphere of influence. Okay, this is geared towards your sphere of influence. We know that there are a percentage of the population of homeowners that are out there that are in a mortgage forbearance or are in a tough financial situation. Our job is to find them and help them, okay? Part of how we find them, this is um, initially, this is like a care call. There's still some people that are working from home. This is, you guys, we use like the Ford script here, right? So this is, we know that we've been in a pandemic. There was a lot of people that were working from home. We're using um, a roundabout script here to figure out their employment status without saying, do you still have a job, right? right? It's, how's it going? Are you working from home? How's that going? Right, because this is somebody that we know or we have a relationship with, right? Uh, next, we have something called third party scripting. Third party scripting is we and we ask a question, right, that is designed and we lead in with saying, Hey, I have a lot of clients that I have a third party that is worried about this thing that you might be worried about. So that instead of asking you directly about it, you feel more comfortable 
telling me about your own situation because now you're you feel like you're part of this third party of people. That's third party scripting. This is a script technique. I have a lot of clients worried about the next several mortgage payments that they're going to make. Or I have a lot of clients that are worried about uh, the moratorium on foreclosures that recently ended and how that's going to impact them. Right. This is this is what we are saying, right? Third party scripting. I have a lot of clients that have been asking me questions about X. Uh, do you have any questions about that? Right? Is there anything that I might be able to help you with your concerns around? I just wanted to check in and see how things are going with you. I have a lot of clients calling me about X. I wanted to check in and see how things are going with you on this. Right? From there, we have things like many folks aren't aware of renegotiating their bills. I'm very concerned about the forbearance agreements that they've seen. I would be happy to review the paperwork you should have received. There is a goal. The goal is we want to know. Well, one, we want to set up a next call with them, right? We want to move the ball forward. We want to identify those individuals that actually might need a little bit of help. And we have four things. Do they have adequate reserves? Can they pull funds from their equity? If they're in a forbearance agreement, the answer is probably no, right? They might not be able to refi. Um, have they entered a forbearance agreement? And is their employment stable? Four goals. We're setting up a next call with homework. It might be that we're looking into a refi. It might be that they're calling their creditors, but here's the thing. It's send me your forbearance agreement. I'm happy to review it for you because we want to get that next step in the process. This is not, and I'm going to note what's really important here. This is not, hey, let's sell your property, right? It's, hey, Let's move the ball forward and figure out what the next step is. Why don't you send me your forbearance agreement? I'm happy to review it. We can go over it together and we can discuss what your next options are. Okay. All right. The goal in that um, next call is to explain the forbearance agreement. So we know there's generally four types. We want to talk to them about that. I don't know if you are aware of this, but in your particular re re uh, payment agreement or what we're seeing here is that your creditors actually haven't determined which the repayment agreement is gonna be. It could be one of these four things. Um, how do you feel about that? What does that look like? Or I don't know if you know this, but you're gonna owe a lump sum. So you have reserves to be able to do that. What's your repayment plan strategy? Is there one, right? Uh, discussing, planning the seed to self appropriate. So this is the, next, the second conversation is where now we're starting to plant that seed of selling if it is appropriate for them. You know, in your particular, what I'm seeing in your forbearance agreement is you're going to owe a lump sum at the end. Um, this is what it's saying right over here. Is this uh, something that you are comfortable with? Because in all honesty, I would hate you to be in a position where you get foreclosed on um, because there's a lot of implications there. You're going to walk away with less money. And I see you have about $200,000 in equity on your property right now. Might, it might make sense to sell my personal opinion. I just want to share that with you because I want you to be aware of all your options, right? This is, this is um, planting that seed. And then again, guess what? Employment changes. Is their employment stable? Employment changes every day, right? Set up the next call or next appointment. So I'm going to note when we originally launched this, it was all calls because we weren't doing in-person. This has changed a little bit, right? Obviously now we have in-person. Next call, speak with the financial planner if they are withdrawing uh, retirement funds, exploring other options for liquidity, personal loans, et cetera. Um, the goal is to potentially establish a repayment, a repayment plan strategy, review national forbearance numbers, review the value of the home and equity position, any changes in employment stability. Now, here's the thing. Determine if they would stay in the property. They may need to speak with an attorney. They may need to speak with the CPA. This works a lot better if you're the one with the attorney and the CPA to refer them, right? If you've got a great person that's part of this strategy with them, because people don't just keep attorney and CPA cards in their pocket, in their wallets, yeah. right? That doesn't happen. So if you have those relationships, there's something called the law of reciprocity. And so there's two laws I'm going to talk about, the law of reciprocity and, um, the law of emotional proximity. The law of reciprocity says, when I help you, you want to help me. When somebody gives you something, you want to give them something in return. That is 
human nature, the law of reciprocity. The law of emotional proximity says this, when I'm in a really difficult situation and I need to make a decision, I'm a, if I can't reach the first person that I think of, I'm gonna reach the first person that's in front of me. This is the, we walk into a store and somebody says, hey, can I help you? And we say, we're just looking, it's a script, right? We say, we're just looking. Then we go and we get all the clothes that we wanna try on, the fitting rooms are locked. We're not looking for that first person to try to help us. We're looking for whoever's closest to us. That's what happens in this industry is that somebody is in a rough situation and the moment that they're ready to move forward, are, are, do you have a deep enough relationship with them that they're gonna call you or are they gonna talk to whoever the first person is that's in front of them? I can't answer that for you. All I can tell you is this is how you build a relationship if it is a uh, forbearance, right? If it is a forbearance. There's another script. Let's see, did I throw it on here? Uh, so I'm gonna note this strategy actually came. So I know graphics wise, right? It is not the prettiest thing in the world. It's like created in Word. Here's the thing. The agent who created this, because she is much, much smarter than me, is the number one REO agent in the nation. So I'm not giving you guys something that came out of my computer and my Microsoft Word, right? Is this is from the number one REO agent in the nation. And this is an actual flyer. So you saw the stuff that um, Jorge was showing from uh, our marketing partnership with Javier. Uh, this is an actual marketing piece. Her name is Christina Griffin. You can look her up. Uh, that Christina sends out, really simple, right? That she sends out around forbearances, around what was happening in the market. She sent it out last year to her client. Very, good. Very simple, right? It's really simple. It's not like it's a big thing, but here's the thing. It's in a market of the moment, you have to have the message of the moment. We're not calling people and saying, do you want to buy, sell, or invest in real estate, right? It's, that's not the message right now because that's not the market that we're in. We have to call with the message for the market that we're going after, Okay. So this, it's, it's specific on strategy. There is a pre-foreclosure and loss mitigation script. I didn't have this one in the handout. It wasn't printing, but I will um, share this one as well. This one is a little bit different. This is now somebody is potentially getting a notice of default, starting to go through the pre-foreclosure process. This is a script to go for that. My name is Monica. I'm a realtor with Keller Williams. I specialize in the foreclosure process and I'm contacting you in order to offer your potential services during this difficult time. According to the county records, the data that you get from Javier, right? According to the county records, your bank has already begun the foreclosure process of your home. Foreclosure can be potentially confusing and you should know that you have options. Have you spoken with a real estate agent to guide you through this process? Have you determined whether or not you wanna try and sell your home or are you planning on bringing your mortgage current and remaining in your home? Great, I'm gonna note that. Here's the thing, that doesn't mean I'm not gonna call them again, okay? Yes, I have a plan to bring my mortgage current. Great, are there any questions that you had? Great, if anything changes, I'd love to be in contact. I'm probably calling them again in two months or, or shorter, right? Because things change, they have a plan but it might not work out, right? If the answer is no, well, first, you should know you are not alone in this predicament and you have options. My job is to help people going through the foreclosure to determine the options they have at their disposal. If it's okay with you, I would like the chance to help you make sense of what's happening and develop a plan that best suits your situation before the bank continues the process. What attempts, if any, have you made to sell your home? If you were to sell, what are some of the goals you would hope to accomplish for their sale? Have you been in contact with the lender to discuss, with your lender to discuss your home status? Are you familiar with the short sale process? If they need short sale, right? If you're seeing, this is rare. So this is gonna be a rare one. Um, but if they need short sale, are you familiar with the short sale process and how it can benefit both you and your lender? If you're interested, our next step would be for me to take a look at your property and discuss options, set the appointment. Okay, so two script guides that I'm giving you here. One is, this is your network, you're going forward, you're discussing forbearances, you're discussing what's happening with, with the situation that they're in. The second is, 
I'm pulling county records, right? Or I'm getting the leads coming into my inbox and I need to call through them. And this is that call. Fair? All right. So I know that was fast, you guys. I, I shoved it into a little bit of time. Um, do I have any questions, ahas, or thoughts? I love it. Awesome. Yeah. Well, good. I'm glad. I'm glad. Any, what, what, if anything, are you guys implementing? Definitely calling the NODs with the script. The script is really good. Yeah. 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 And I'm going to know. I'm going to be honest with you guys. So if you guys remember, right? I would say there's two things that I, if this was me, that I would do, right? When I taught the class on um, the 10 things that Cody Gibson did to generate listings, right? One of those was to door knock at least one notice of default property every single day. Because I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. So don't get me wrong. Not all of you are going to do this strategy. I know that. That's what happens, right? Is, is, People will come and we want you to understand what's going on in the market. And some of you will implement this strategy and some of you won't. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just it, whoever this aligned with and this feels like the right thing for you, implement. But what I know is, you know, there's a lot of people talking about this and what's happening in the market right now. And anytime we know a lot of people love to jump on the phones and that's going to be um, impactful. And some of them will not pick up their phones. So you will increase right, you will increase your chance of hitting by visiting a notice of default property every single day, at least five days a week. Um, I know one of our agents, when I taught that class a year ago, she, we actually, we had a speaker that taught that one, uh, Michael Putnam. She went and did that one thing. And within two weeks, she got a listing. Okay, so it's the one thing that will absolutely differentiate you. But yes, Call the NOD. Call the NOD. Yeah. Awesome, you guys. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna know we're gonna wrap up. Oh, wait, I have a chat. Can we get a copy of the script? Uh yes, Robert, it's gonna be in the hub. So we will have it posted uh as well for you. Uh as well. Um, one thing I'm gonna note. So we have a couple things that are coming up that I want to make sure you guys are aware of. Um, I know we have some guests in here. So the first thing I'm going to share is our Wednesday uh, training. It's going to be a lunch and learn here at the office at 12 p.m. with a phenomenal individual named Fred Said. He's a certified national trainer and an active realtor um, here in and has trained over the past five years over uh, thousands of real estate agents. More importantly, his team here in California, right here in California, they are tracking to close 175 units this year, wow. 100 million in volume and 2.5 million in gross commission income. Okay. And he's going to be talking about my favorite topic. Who can guess what it is? Commercial. No, I like commercial a lot. Starts with a D. People. No, no, not my favorites. <laughs> Come on, you guys, I teach this all the time. No, who was in my class on Friday? I know you guys have to hear database, database, database. database. He is actually, um, one of the things that was really interesting for him, he saw vulnerabilities with his database on um, the iBuyers that were in the market. And so his strategy has been, how does he protect his clients um, and his database from losing that business to iBuyers? So he will be here in office training. He just expanded into our office. We're really excited about having him uh, on board as a part of, of Downey. Um, so he will be here on Wednesday at noon for our lunch and learn. That is going to be open for all guests. Uh, for our associates here for KW at Southeast Los Angeles, we will have our all partners meeting on Tuesday at 3 p.m. followed by happy hour. So look forward to seeing you guys all there. Those that are at home, I hope you guys have a phenomenal day. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank Bye, you, guys. thank you, thank you, Monica. Absolutely. Absolutely.